new, with new redware on display. In all, approximately 400 pieces of redware from, 20, from 37 lenders have been showcased. The second installment of the exhibit will be available to the public when Landis Valley reopens. We have extended the exhibit to December 31st, 2021. So please come experience the pieces in person when we reopen. Why isn't it advancing? Well, oh, sorry, don't look at that. In the meantime, you can view part one of the online Redware exhibit on our website. Part two will be posted soon. Through the website, you can also purchase exhibit catalog that covers both year of the exhibit. Tonight, I will be showing you my own personal highlights of the exhibit. I personally selected all 400 pieces in the exhibit with the aim to showcase the variety and skill of the Redware potters. We ended up with two years of different Redware exhibits because I could not narrow down all the wonderful for wonderful pieces I saw into one year. I've been often been asked what my favorite pieces are and every time I will pick something new. Through these highlights, I'm hoping to show the variety of the potters in work, including utilitarian pieces and wacky ones. We will move through a variety of artifacts until we come to my favorite piece that, that has been exhibited in both years of the exhibition. The first grouping of artifacts I selected are redware tiles that were seen on homesteads around the area. These tiles are known as beaver, beaver tail roof tiles and handmade by Pennsylvania German potters using molds. They learned the technique and style in Germany. Number one and, one and seven are from the Shantz Homestead in Berks County. Number six is dated 1763 and from the Ole Valley, Berks County. Number four is dated 1782 and number three is inscribed 1768. Some of the phases have been grooved with gutters or lines running lengthways on the tiles. These grooves were produced by the fingers of the potters, each finishing his tile with lines that seem most appropriate to him. A two-fold purpose was filled by these groups. First, they broke the monotony of the otherwise plain tile. Secondly, they furnished a means of keeping the rainwater away from the lateral joints and allowing water to run down the roofs more efficiently. The tiles also have a built-in nozzle or nose on the back, which acts as a hook since the tiles can't be nailed into place. The picture on the left is a view of the market from the corner of Shippen and 2nd Street in Philadelphia in 1787, as seen in the Columbian Magazine. Note the red tiled roof on the side of the wine, tea, brandy, and coffee shop. Several, several tiled 18th century roofs still survive in Berks County, especially in the Ole Valley. The photograph on the right shows a roof in a dilapidated condition not from the failure of the tiles, but from the rotting of the wooden beams and rafters so they could no longer carry their load. Pennsylvania Germans elevated redware from utilitarian household tools to works of art using slipware and screw beetle decoration. They brought these techniques from Germany and passed them down over generations. Slipware was a technique of decorating or covering a piece with different colored clay. Slip or watered down clay was used in a variety of colors, including cream, red, or dark brown. A slip cup was used to quickly apply linear designs onto the pieces using hollow quills that protruded from the bottom of the cup. The potter would then press the slip decoration into the piece using a rolling pin. These are some of the slip decorated pieces in the exhibit. The piece on loan from the Daniel Boone Homestead was discovered in the chimney of the house during restoration. It is believed that it was placed there by the Boones. These are some of the slip decorated loaf dishes on display, except for the bottom right one. This loaf dish was not displayed, but is one of the favorites I've seen. 
It was sold at Christie's in 2003. It is from circa 1775, has a six quill yellow slip decoration and green dabs of color. The other ones have three to four quill slip decorations. This is a two piece 20 inch high molded urn made by Emmanuel Souter at the New Erection Pottery in Rockingham County, Virginia. Souter grew up living and working on a farm. At 18 years old, he was farming and learning the trade of potting. As a Mennonite during the Civil War, Souter refused to join the Confederate Army. He furnished a substitute to go in his place and then paid $500 so that substitute could come home. During the war, he went to Pennsylvania and worked at Cowden and Wilcox in Harrisburg. When he returned to Virginia, he had a pottery shop on the farm. He operated three different potteries over 46 years and ran each one individually. He sold the last pottery shop in 1897. In his diary that day, he wrote, I was in town on business at the pottery, sold it for $2,000. This relieves me of further trouble without works. The pottery continued to operate a couple of years under different management until it closed. Most butter prints are, are hand carved out of blocks of wood like these on the right. During the 18th and 19th centuries, farmers used butter prints and molds to decorate their butter. Each farmer used a different print that was specific to their individual farms to differentiate their butter from other people's butter at market. More butter prints were made in Pennsylvania in the 19th century than in any other state. Rare are redware butter prints such as seen here in the center and on the left with similar designs inspired by nature as those found in wood. These are a variety of coin banks. Number one was made at the Nieper Pottery in Montgomery County. Number two has a molded dog, applied leaf, and white slip dots made in 1877 by Christian Shooter in Berks County. Number four is a bank shaped like a doghouse, and number seven is shaped like a schoolhouse. Number five was made by Caleb Darlington Cope in Chester County at the Pottery Factory. Number six is a Pierce bank with a bird finial that was possibly made by Jared Heron. This is a black glazed teapot made between 1840 to 1850 by the Northern Liberty Pottery. In 1812, Thomas Hay established the pottery in Philadelphia. He produced redware and stoneware. At the third annual exhibition at the Franklin Institute in 1826, Thomas Haig received a bronze medal for the best red earthenware sent in and much improvement in the art. After Haig's death, his sons James and Thomas carried on the pottery during which they used steam to grind the clay. Medals have been used to commemorate important events and to recognize and reward individual accomplishments and achievements. By the 18th century, France had become the leader of sculpture in miniature. In fact, many of the dyes for early American medals were cast in France. Such was the case with this 1777 Benjamin Franklin portrait medallion made in Paris by Italian sculptor Jean Baptiste Nini. Nini created the medallions from carved wax molds that were cast with clay. He created the details by hand. The medallions were commissioned by a businessman and friend of Benjamin Franklin. There are five types of Franklin medallions made from drawings sent to Nini, rather than drawings done of his own hands. The first medallion had a fur cap, as seen in the center. Nini also sent examples to Paris for approval with a liberty cap, a face with spectacles, and a face without spectacles. The additional pieces shown here are created using different materials. These are two flower pots made by Enos Medley in Chester County. The one on the right is inscribed Mary Hipple, East Goshen, 1826. 
The one on the left is inscribed Ann Fawcett, West Town Township. Smedley established the Westchester Pottery in 1831. He used clay imported from Philadelphia by wagon and railroad for his pottery. He also discovered clay in Southern Chester and Delaware counties. He received a diploma from the Franklin Institute for his skill in decorating. After retiring from the pottery business, Smedley was a leading contractor in the borough and invested in real estate. There were more than 100 deeds to or from him on record in Chester County. This is a wall pocket made by George S. Freshly in Lebanon County. It can be wall mounted and filled with flowers. George S. Freshly owned Lebanon pottery and stove brickworks where he made all kinds of crust crockery and stove ranges. He was also the proprietor of the Eureka Ice Company, which sold coal and ice. Freshly was known more as a coal and ice merchant than a potter. He often donated ice to the Good Samaritan Hospital. The Lebanon Daily News listed a for sale ad advertisement in 1917 for an old established coal business that Freshly was selling on account of impaired health. These are some other examples of wall pockets. The pair on the upper right were made in 1879 by Anthony Wise Bacher in Virginia. His primary glaze of brown and tan, sometimes spattered, running or marbled, has been indicative of his work. The wall pocket on the left was made by potter and farmer George Wagner in Carbon County. The wall pocket on the lower right is made out of silk and has a note with it that reads, made by Emma C. Diller about 1854. Emma Diller was the mother of Henry and George Landis, the founders of Landis Valley. This is one of the oldest pieces on exhibit. It was discovered prior to the construction of the Metropolitan Detention Center on Arch Street in Philadelphia. It is a sugar mold from 1685 through 1850. The sugar trade was an important part of Philadelphia, Philadelphia's economy. While sugar and molasses came on ships to Philadelphia from the West Indies in return for flour, preserved meat, and wood products. The raw sugar was refined in Philadelphia into white sugar for the table. During the refining process, molds and jars were used to crystallize the sugar. The sugar was packed in conical molds with holes in their tips. The molds were then fit, fitted into jars so that the molasses could drain off the hardening sugar. The molds are unglazed redware with smooth interiors so that the sugar could slide free. The sugar loaves that came out of the molds were cone shaped and would be cut with special pinchers. The mold, these molds and jars often broke due to their size. Some of them were one and a half feet in diameter and about three feet tall. Once broken, they were used as fill before buildings were constructed in swamp areas. At this archaeological site, over 3,000 shards of sugar molds were found. These three pieces were made by Henry Fair in Topahawken Township, Berks County. Fair owned and operated the Henry Fair Pottery by himself from 1867 to 1891. The bank on the left was made by Henry Fair for his daughter. All these pieces were made by Carl W. Bach in Allentown. Bach, an immigrant from Stuttgart, opened the city of Allentown's first and only pottery works. Bach came from a long line of German redware potters. He specialized in utilitarian, horticultural, and decorative pieces. His primary preoccupation was making flower pots. Bach was renowned for his skill and industry, both in pottery and also as a florist who kept greenhouses. In 1896, the pottery works was turned over to Bach's son, who operated the business until 1905. After that, the business began to focus more on greenhouse plants and cut flowers. These items came from the original showroom which were carefully placed in storage by the great grandson of Karl Bach. Number one is a jar. 
Number two is a gravity fed chicken waterer. Number four is a coin bank. And number five is a chicken feeder. Number three is a head jug. Head jugs have a ritual significance in Switzerland for healing illnesses that are believed to reside in the head. It is unknown whether box head jugs were intended for this purpose. This is another head jug that is in the exhibit. The intended purpose for this piece is also a mystery. However, it is very similar to a chia pet, but made approximately 100 years earlier. These are two redware apothecary jars with tin lids. They were used in the Hennish drugstore, which opened in 1782. It was one of the oldest pharmacies in the United States and was owned and operated by one family for 143 years in Lancaster City. The store passed from Carl to his son Augustus and then another son, John. John's son, Charles, became the owner of the shop in 1849. When Charles died, a nephew took over and eventually his widow ran the store until the 1930s. This is one of the best examples of a pure compote bowl that I've seen. A compote bowl is a vase shaped dish on top of a base stem. It was made to serve the culinary dish called compote, which is basically a mixture of fruits with sugar syrup combined with items such as nuts, cinnamon sticks, and cloves. This unusually large bowl had its slit melt in firing, which makes the design and inscription hard to see. The design is of a spread eagle with a shield on its breast. It clutches arrows and olive branches in its talons, and in its beak it holds a flying banner that reads, Freedom, Liberty. The inscription around the rim reads, Say only that which is for good and become easy to love. A slang version of the inscription would be, you would be easier to love if not so critical. This is a scrofito decorated plate with copper oxide or green slip. It was made by Rudolf Gerber, who was active from 1811 to 1819. The sheriff and fish designs are frequently associated with religious symbolism. These are three Deal pottery plates. The Deal pottery was founded by Samuel Deal and later run by his sons, Josiah and William. Deal pottery was known for their slip decorated flowers. On the right are three additional examples not in the exhibit. These are two slip decorated plates made by Simon Singer in Applebachville, Haycock Township in Bucks County, which can be seen on the plate on the right. Singer purchased the Conrad Moonbuyer pottery for $2,500 at a sale, sheriff sale. The pottery operated until 1912. He was known for elaborately inscribed slip decorated plates such as these. The plates on the left reads J. M. Shaw, house painter, paper hanger, Quaker Town, Bucks County, Penn. James M. Shaw was a paper hanger and painter until his death. These are two Simon Sigger plates we decided to not put in the exhibit because we had the other two examples that I showed you. How I wanted to share them with you. The one on the left reads, made over the 1810 pattern for H.H. H. Youngkin in Haycock, 1886 to A.B. Herring Esquire, S. Singer Potter. Youngkin was perhaps the owner of the pattern or plate mold, dating from 1810 over which the new plate was formed. In 1886, Abel Brinton Herring became the owner of the, this plate. The plate on the right reads, Simon Singer, earthenware maker. Many potters felt the need to say something on their work. There was commentary on social issues, 
There were humorous inscriptions and some pieces reminding others of religious teachings. Through these inscriptions, potters preserved many of the common sayings of the day in their own dialect. These sayings include proverbs, mottos, rhymes, and quotations. It is sometimes difficult to translate these inscriptions. Language can be very peculiar on pottery inscriptions. The words display characteristics that are unusual, even in comparison to other writings of the times. The potters would blend both oral and written forms without any concern for correctness or grammar. Alan Kaiser, Patrick Don Moyer, and William Osterman assisted with translating the inscriptions on the exhibited redware. Number one by Jacob Yoder reads, from the earth with understanding, the potter makes everything. Luck, blaze, and clay is his honest money's worth. Number two by George Hubner reads, no plaster can heal me, heal me, so wilt thou hasten with me out of the world of sorrow into a beautiful canopy of heaven. Number three by Samuel W. Wanger reads, clean and shave me, nice and fine that I may please my loved ones. Number four was made by Englishman Joseph Smith. Smith used English words on his pottery instead of more commonly used German. This plate reads, this dish and heart shall never part. What is also interesting about this plate is children's author Catherine Millhouse used the plate in a book she wrote and illustrated in 1940 entitled Lavinia, A Story of the Pennsylvania Country. She dedicated a copy of the book to Milton Hershey. It reads, Milton J. Hershey, in whose museum Lavinia's dish has found a permanent resting place. This is page 28 to 29 of the book. You can see the various red rare plates and the one shown above Lavinia's head is the one we have displayed in the exhibit. Both of these plates are made by George Huebner. Number one is one of my favorites and reads, if it weren't for little men and little roosters, the cradles and chicken houses would stand empty. Number two reads, Susan stouts her dish. As you would the men to do to you, do even so to them. This plate was by Samuel Troxell reads, if I could swim like a swan, Crow like a barnyard rooster, court like a sparrow, then I would be the darling of all the virgins. These beautiful scrofito decorated plates were made by Andrew Hedman in Bucks County. Andrew Hedman arrived in Philadelphia in 1771 from Germany with his brother, who was a master potter. They established a pottery in Philadelphia where they produced utilitarian redware until 1786. That year, Andrew Hedman moved to Rock Hill Township in Bucks County, where he founded a pottery on roughly 30 acres he purchased. Scrofito was created by using a sharp tool to scratch through the white or yellowish slip that was applied to the piece, revealing the red clay underneath. The whole plate would then be covered with a clear glaze. In the center on the left are two fat lamps that were possibly made by John Neese in Montgomery County. The wick was in the spout and animal fat or cooking oil was burned to provide light. On the right is a grease lamp made by Jacob Mellinger, who also used animal fat or grease as fuel. This rare pie plate has a scrofito horse and rider in the back and a slip inscription and date on the front. The inscription reads, where people sing, settle there, because evil people have no songs. The plate on the left has been in both years of the exhibit. When we borrowed it, the Philadelphia Museum of Art said that the signature read O.J. Swin. I could not find any potters with that name. After completing some research, I found the plate on the right with the same signature. The dark green background, part with dated interior, 
impressed circles, and overall style of this graffito decoration are all characteristic of the work of Potter, Farmer, and Miller, Solomon Grimm. A small number of plates and jars attributed to Grimm rank as some of the most ambitiously decorated examples of early American redware known. These are some other examples of Solomon Grimm's work. All these pieces were made by Willoughby Smith. When he was 19, he started working with Joseph and Daniel Fague until he purchased the pottery shop in partnership with his mother-in-law, Rebecca Fague, in 1864. The shop operated as Fague and Smith Pottery until 1881 when Smith brought out Rebecca. The Willoughby Smith Pottery operated until Smith's death in 1905. Willoughby Smith was unusual because he produced pieces for both mail order and local customers. The center photograph, the center top photograph is of a flower pot sample kit and carrying case Willoughby Smith used to show what size flower pots he could make. Smith produced 1,000 small flower pots a day and 75,000 to 100,000 flower pots per year. The small the bottom center photograph is Willoughby Smith's slip cup. In German, the words read white, green, yellow. The Moravian Pottery and Tile Works was founded and built by Henry Chapman, Chapman Mercer. Mercer started producing tiles at the pottery in 1898. He wanted to preserve old methods of handmaking tiles while portraying dying art forms with his tile designs. Mercer operated the factory until his death in 1930. It was then passed on to his assistant, Frank Swain, who ran it until his death in 1952. It was reopened to the public in 1964. On the left is the tile mosaic Summer from 1920. The Mercer Museum has one for each of the four seasons. On the right is the tile The Reaper. Similar tiles are in the center depicting other farming tool chores. There's a very unusual unglazed beehive, which imitates the form of a rye straw bee skeb as seen on the right. Skebs are essentially upturned straw baskets under which bees form their naturally curvy honeycomb. Both of these vases are attributed to the Abraham Reeser pottery. The Abraham Reeser pottery was built in 1832 by Abraham Reeser, who was not a potter. He hired a German to operate the pottery, pottery for him. The German also taught his son Peter the trade. Peter continued the pottery after his father's death. The clay used in the pottery was dug in the family farm. It came in four kinds, blue, gray, red, and brown. This is a redware mortar and pestle, which is used to crush and grind ingredients into a fine paste or powder. Mortar and pestles are usually made out of hard wood, metal, ceramic, or hard stone. One of my favorite Lancaster City potters is the Gas family that arrived in Lancaster in 1818 from Baltimore and Germany. The Gas family formed a, a potting dynasty throughout Lancaster City in the 19th century, adding to the strength of the industry. By 1860, there were seven pottery shops in Lancaster City. Conrad Gass established a pottery at the corner of Prince and James Streets in 1842. The annual sales for the pottery shop were $4,000 to $6,000. An average 600 pots were made per day. Amos Gass was apprenticed to his father Conrad and became a partner in the business in 1877. Henry Gass Sr., Conrad's brother, worked as a potter with his sons Levi, Henry Jr., and John. His pottery works were in various locations throughout Lancaster City. Henry Gass Jr. took over the family business when his father died. One of his sons, Harry, became a potter. The business closed in 1913. The pieces here from the estate of Clark Cass were excavated from the location of the Henry Gass Pottery Works at Manor Street in 1977. 
Then this valley is grateful to the state of Clark House because these pieces were recently donated to the Landis Valley Collection. Every piece here, except this one, was made by Henry Gass. This one was made by Amos Gass. This is a Seder Square palindrome plate from 1880. This square of 25 letters reads the same forwards and backwards, up and down, and has been documented in ritual use since at least 79 AD when it was preserved at Pompeii. The popular powwowing manual, The Long Lost Friends, provides instructions for extinguishing fire without water by using a plate inscribed with a Seder Square palindrome on both sides. The plate was to be thrown into the fire in order to ritually extinguish the blaze in time of emergency. There's no agreed upon translation at this time. Other examples not in redware are also seen here. These are two rare redware doll heads. The male is the only existing example of a boy redware doll head. The head, neck, and shoulder plates were sewn to doll bodies made out of fabrics. These are both puzzle jocks, which were an amusing tavern game or a conversation starter. It appears impossible to pour liquid from a puzzle jug without spilling it. However, the jug has a hidden interior tube that runs around the holes. It takes trial and error to figure out how to drink out of a puzzle jug. This piece was made by Solomon Bell of the famous Bell family, which included Samuel and John. Solomon worked in Virginia with his brother Samuel. They operated there for more than four decades. Solomon died from an illness brought on by the heat of the kiln. This is a three piece, 16 eight inch high, amazing water cooler from 1850 to 1870. These are more pieces in the exhibit from the Bell family. These are some of my favorite pieces in the whole exhibit. I urge you to see them in person because photographs do not do them justice. They are miniatures and less than four inches high. Potters produced a large number of miniature pieces in redware. Most miniature redware were either unglazed or covered with black or clear lead slip. slip. Unique miniatures are those with several colors. This is a tea canister from 1769 made by Englishman Joseph Smith. You may remember used English words on his pottery instead of German. I showed you a plate earlier. You can see 1769 inside a pretzel motif, J. Smith, and finally T followed by a key, E followed by a spoon, and A. This is a reassembled, slip decorated redware bowl that might have been made by a colonial potter in Philadelphia between 1730 to 1750. Its fragments were recovered during a 1982 excavation at Stenton, the country house of James Logan, William Penn's agent and proprietary secretary. He was also in charge of Pennsylvania's Indian policy. The lack of wear to the glazed interior surface suggests that this bowl was created for show rather than everyday use. Possibly the only known piece of redware made in America prior to 1750 that is decorated with the image of a Native American. He has been identified and his name can be seen on the top of your screen. He was the chief of the Magus, a group of the Mohawk Indians. 1710, the chief was also known by his Anglican name, Brant, and he went to England with three other Iroquois representatives. The slipped figure on the bowl was taken from a set of four mezzotin of the four Native Americans engraved by John Simon at the oil por portraits commissioned by Queen Anne. This is a Snow Hill nunnery slip decorated redware soup bowl attributed to the Bell family pottery of Waynesboro. It's one of the latest additions to Landis Valley redware collection. In the 1790s, Peter Langman urged the Antietam congregation in Franklin County 
which was practicing the Dunker faith to adopt the celibate lifestyle of Ephrata Cloister. Barbara Snowberger was interested, but her husband, Andreas, was not. Barbara left the congregation with her youngest child with the intention of becoming a sister at Ephrata. Andreas found them and begged her to return, saying he changed his mind. 1798, Barbara, Andreas, and three of their adult children, Barbara, Elizabeth, and John, formed their own communal society based on the Ephrata model. It would soon become known as Snow Hill Cloister, and they were the first celibate members of the society. Snow Hill Cloister was established on their farm and housed a celibate brotherhood and sisterhood in a large community house or nunnery. Married members were permitted to worship with the celibates. Snow Hill never grew very large. By 1872, there were eight brothers and eight sisters. The society was disbanded in March 1889. The contents of the buildings were sold at auction on August 11, 1997. Forty red rare bowls made by Waynesboro Potter were sold at this auction. We saw other pieces by the Bell family earlier. These bowls were used to serve stew during the love feast, a special communal meal. These are other Snow Hill bowls that I've seen or that have been sold recently. This is a bank made in the shape of an empire style chest of drawers with a swirl in the glaze imitating the grain of rural wood. It was made in 1867 by the Northern Liberty Pottery. James and Thomas Jr. Haig took the pottery over from their father, Thomas Sr., after his death. We saw a teapot made by Thomas Sr. already. In 1842, James Haig is listed separately as an earthenware manufacturer in Philadelphia. These are two of my favorite figurines in the exhibit. I enjoy the humor in them. The one on the left was made by Joseph K. Penny in Berks County. The one on the right was made by Milton Hoops in Chester County. Through the exhibit and bringing together so many pieces of redware and being able to examine them closely, we made a number of discoveries during our planning. I already showed you the Solomon Grim plate we identified. We also attributed this lion to Milton Hoops, who, as I said, made the figurine on the right. We made the attribution based on the design on the base of both pieces. These are three buttons, which are believed to have been made in Nor Norwalk, Connecticut. I was surprised I'd learned there were buttons made out of redware. On the left is a birdhouse made by Vickers Pottery from 1840 to 1860. Thomas Vicker and his son John were Quaker potters, farmers, abolitionists, and agents on the Underground Railroad. Often runaway slaves were concealed in the hay among the pottery in the Vickers wagons. Vickers pottery also made the flower pot on the right. Now we have come to my favorite piece in the whole exhibit. My most favorite piece is this charger from the 18th century. It believes that the inscription reads, this it is that Christ suffered for us and for our benefit, and of which the spirit remains as a pledge. It is believed that the potter of this charger was attempting to render in scorpito and slip a broke engraving of Michelangelo's marble sculpture, the deposition. As with the deposition, four figures are depicted, the dead body of Jesus Christ, Nicodemus, Mary Magdalene, and the Virgin Mary. Looking closely, one can see the lance, reed, rooster, pillar, hand, and nails depicted. Those are my highlights from the two-year Redware exhibit. If you ask me tomorrow, I might show you something else, such as a molded fish glass, a slip decorated political plate, or a jelly mold. Please visit the exhibit in person when Landis Valley reopens. Photographs do not do these pieces justice. You need to experience the breadth, artistry, and variety in person. 
You will never see an exhibit of redware of this size again with so many outstanding pieces. Make sure you get there before December 31st, 2021. Thank you.